I really hope that got on the recording. Maybe didn't. Uh, hopefully on my video that got. Did you get? Did you see that? No, the some something popped up on my screen, so it blocked my view. Good for you. Yeah, I just kicked my guitar over. Oh, which one? This is a seagull acoustic, and I've beat the shit out of this thing. It's it's a shame. It's such a nice guitar. It deserves better. Yep. Those are those are good guitars. <laughs> I, I got it because this guy really wanted a fucking Martin and then he took it back or but the guy sold him the seagull. So he takes the seagull back the next day and just buys the Martin. And so this like eleven hundred dollar guitar got marked down to like five fifty just because it was used. Right time, right place. Yeah. Uh, do you have you ever played Martins? Do you have a Martin? Are you, are you a Martin guy? I have a Martin OM28. I like it. Yeah, it's uh it's a cool guitar. I think I mean nowadays if I was going to spend that kind of money on a guitar, I'd get a Gibson uh Super Jumbo like Elvis would have played. Those <laughs> things are just big and like you can just strum it and it's just in that buttery strum. Cuz I don't really do finger picking, which is kind of what the smaller body is designed for. I mean, I do it I do it sometimes. Um, but I think my priority now would be getting a big strummer, like a super jumbo. Huh? You see, I've always found, I've found Martins to be a little overrated. Like the old ones are really cool and I'm definitely parroting what the old people would say. I've, I've heard even my dad would be, well, if you get yourself an old one, man, those are priceless. But I mean, like, I don't know. I've played maybe one or two where I was like, wow, that is a nice guitar. Every other one I've tried in like a store, I've never been, I've never been like, oh, I need to buy this. Good name, though. I think, well, two things. One on like vintage instruments versus new instruments. There's something kind of, I don't know. There's like a thing about vintage instruments. Um, one thing I heard yesterday, somebody said that something about, you know, Older instruments, they were made less on a mass production scale. So maybe that had something to do with quality. Um, I think, of, I think you know, one of the biggest things would be if you can actually get the guitar maker to make one that's kind of specifically for your needs um, or just, you know, somewhat tailored for you as an individual, that would be sick. Like, like Hendrix would get like a demo fuzz pedal like right as fuzz was coming into being a thing and then he'd tell the 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 pedal maker or whatever he he liked this aspect of it so make it more like you know make take the top end off of the eq or whatever he he you know he, he knew what he want he liked about it and then make it specifically for what he wanted so yeah I'm I'm convinced in today's economy that I'll never achieve such luxury as where I can do nothing but play my music all day and have people make things for me the way I want them to. I feel like there's always some other source of income I'm going to need to fund these wild and crazy fantasies. It's a tough world for musicians, man. It really <laughs> is, especially nowadays if you actually play real music, you know, and you're not like, uh, I mean... I drive by people in the car and stuff and I, I'm sort of like, you know, wh what are they listening to? And it's always something that doesn't resemble music. It's like, you know, these trap beats and then these like hugely robotic sounding voices. And, you know, there's nothing musical about it in all honesty. And that seems to be what everyone's listening to on average. And, um, guys that actually, you know, write their own songs and like make their own records and, have sort of a, you know, an artistry to it. There's like, you know, so many people out there that are trying to take advantage of those guys and the record labels are included. So, you know, it's a tough world for musicians. But what's stopping you from jumping on the bandwagon of come see my laptop live? I mean, like you've probably proven everything you need to prove to yourself as far as your musical abilities and competence me, I, I just, I missed the opportunity and it's not genuine. So like, I'm not going to be the first guy to be like, oh shit, I could totally exploit my Spotify playlist and download the DJ app on my iPad. Oh shit. That, that's, but like, that's all I need. I could do that. 
I just, I'm not, uh, I don't know if it's like a moral thing or if it's just like, I'm just not made that way. I don't really want to exploit the music because like, you know, my, my, I just love, I got into it because I liked doing it and then I continue to do it because I like doing it. It's kind of like, if I'm not enjoying it, I won't do it. But like, you know, that's what I spend my time doing. So like, I'm, I, I'm always chasing what's going to light me up musically. So, you know, the idea of making a, an album that I don't like, I mean, I just wouldn't do that. I mean, I don't know, maybe if it would, maybe if it took a day and someone had a million dollars lined up, yeah, that would be different, you know? Yeah. Um, before I re even respond to that, uh, I'll jump on your old man hatred train here. Uh, I'm fucking sick of TikTok. I think TikTok's ruining music. Attention spans are getting so bad. Like lip syncing should not be a fucking skill. I don't need to see like the secretary from the job I worked 10 years ago dance to like 10 second sample of crap. Mm -hmm. What's it now? The synth frog thing? I don't know. Are you on TikTok? No, sir. Yeah, I'm not either. I tried. I tried for this. And then like six posts in, I was like, I don't like this. Uh, yeah. TikTok. No, not for me. Not at all. Uh, Instagram. That was kind of like midway through my high school years. So I was like, yeah. Facebook. I, I deleted my Facebook. <laughs> it was just a. Uh, little chunk of dead cyberspace so i was like all right boom sever that um and i don't follow anyone on instagram so i know you're I like the only guy with zero following i think there are others but i i don't like social media really I really, I, I was fantasizing yesterday about a world in which I'd never used the internet, what kind of person I would be, how much influence the internet yeah. has on people's personalities these days. Well, yeah, their personality and just their time. Uh, and I love YouTube. So like, I'm not, I still use the internet a lot. And like, I use Pro Tools for mixing my music. So I, like, I spend a ton of time on the internet too, but like, um, yeah, I like YouTube because I watch music stuff. Like people, you can watch recordings of concerts and stuff. It's not as good as being there, but it's still awesome. Um, Here's the thing about that, though. Like, so one of my goals as an indie musician is I I want a tiny desk concert. Damn it, I want my tiny desk. But the yeah, thing is, if I had never used the internet <laughs> my entire life, I wouldn't know what a fucking tiny desk concert is. What would my goals be? How much like? How much online clout am I chasing, even with the the minimal internet that like the fucking LinkedIn 500 plus crusade I'm on? I'm up 264 now, by the way. We're we're almost done, but like that's such a stupid thing to want and spend time on. Like I really, I could have built a log cabin by now. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, people before the internet was around, it was like people just thought it was crazy because people were saying like yeah there's this thing that's just in the air that you'll be able to tap into and uh they're like yeah that's bullshit that's crazy that's that's magic but you know and, and it's non-material like if you see a ton of people have seen your views and a lot of people have uh, allegedly enjoyed it because they reacted positively via like or whatever that's not you don't get the experience of um you know having people in the crowd that you're playing to and they're, they're buzzing off what you're playing. Therefore you get the gratification. It's like, so with the internet, you lose that. And that reminds me, I was talking about, you know, with a friend, um, the, actually the guy you met when we jammed, uh, Charlie Binko, we were talking about like technology and music and stuff. And, um, one of the ways that technology has changed music among, you know, many, many ways is like when you're playing live, you'll hear, you know, people that are, you know, at the, the top levels of touring acts and whatnot, they'll say like, you know, the way that they know that they're doing well is when people have their phones out and they're recording it. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's so strange in that aspect. 
Is it strange when they start recording you? Because I like I played three gigs in a row where there was a lot of phones in my face, and I was like, "I'm fucking nobody." Like, what do you what do you get from this? Just to prove that you were out? Just to prove that you left the house today? Ah. Yeah, right. It's kind of like, where is this going? <laughs> That's kind of how I feel. Yeah, like what are what, you're recording me? What are you gonna do with that? <laughs> where does it go? Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, but that even gets deeper, right? So, like, all the content that you post on your Facebook, on your Instagram, all the content, when you agree to the terms of use, it becomes public domain. So, me, the, a performer, right? Like, and I'm not going to be all like, oh, wh- why am I not getting royalties for your post? It's not that. It's that, holy shit, how many people are going to see me on someone else's feed that I'll never see and then that's their public domain property and can take and they can fuck with that and do whatever they want. I'm not worried about them taking my intellectual property or ideas. More of like, dude, what if they put a dick in my mouth or something? What if they, they like make a fake profile as me? Like, yeah, I play guitar. I look at this. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> like, fuck. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know for a fact that I've played at least two gigs where there were people with like camera cameras that I never actually saw any, and they were like on us. And I was like, who was that? Yeah, that, <laughs> who the hell? that is, that happened to me one time. That is just so low class. If somebody's going to be like in your face while you're on stage recording you, and then, you know, you ask for a copy of it after, and then they're just nowhere to be found. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm thinking. Uh, I bet. I think the best way to find that stuff is start a political campaign, start a political career. Every video of you will ever like ever made will be released. Oh, yeah, sure. Only only the bad stuff, of course, and out of context. <laughs> and but and it will it will it will just magically come about based on your opposing your opposing candidate or whatnot, their campaign, their slander. Now, polit- politics is, I. This is a this is a good comment I I said once that raises a few eyebrows at a at, at like a you know sophisticated party I go uh, I identify as right identify so people are already like oh shit what's he gonna say I go I identify as apolitical and then and then everyone sort of stops for a minute they go you know I bet I bet so and so enjoyed that but I don't know it's uh, politics it's just I mean that's the worst of it. In my opinion, that is just the absolute worst. It's just pure and utter scum and negativity. And it's just a down, it's just a spiral that goes around that way. It's just, I hate politics so much. (laughs) Yeah, especially when it comes to my art. Like right now, I've I'm writing with a keyboard player and and he the other day just made a political comment. I'm not going to say what it was, but like that was the first time that I had to say like, how about no, how about like not in the art that we're writing here? You know, like we said that day one, no political affiliations, no religious affiliations. Like this is, it doesn't matter who the fuck came out to see you, whoever it is, they're just trying to have a good time. Why, why are you going to come out here with, with some agenda i'm not you too i'm not bono i'm glad i'm not bono i don't want to be bono yeah no, i'm saw, going on record fuck bono i saw you too one time and i i love you too i grew up with you too and you know some of those songs are just i love some of those songs i really do um and i remember it kind of turned me off at the time when he started talking about africa and all that you know just you know people in turbans and it's like you don't even know what he's talking about, but <laughs> you just see, you know, Africa and, you know, turbans and stuff. And, you know, no context at all. If you're like, oh, yeah, it's Bono. So it's just, there's just so much of that. I mean, you know, Neil Young did some good stuff. Ohio, that song and uh, Southern Man. Those are great songs. You know, he's kind of the outlier. But other than that, I, I feel like it really is a turnoff. You have to, you have to be really good. And you have to really mean it to pull it off. And I think Neil Young did that. And I think 99.9% of the other political, musical people, they're just falling back on having an acoustic guitar and needing something to say. And they have nothing to say. 
Oh, just, I know exactly the song you're talking about. Yeah, it, it, it's that rich man and rich man. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I feel about that song. It's like, it's just this whiny fucking woe is me, you know. Whereas I'll take the Sex Pistols. There's another good one. God Save the Queen, sort of anarchistic, you know, fuck the system. It's terrible. We have poor conditions and all that. Let's flip it on its head. They meant it. And it lit, and it lights people up. It's, you know, but, you know, so people that say they like that Richmond and Richmond song, that's my sort of other counterpoint is like, well, I'm not a fan of it. And I recommend the Sex Pistols as like someone who did a similar thing, but like meant it. And like, it's just, it's just great, you know. I I had to listen to somebody's review about the Richmond and North Richmond for to even pay attention to this because like when I heard it I'm like okay it's fucking G C E minor and D what are you all what's so groundbreaking here but fucking the the second verse where he says something about the obese and the fudge rounds like where the fuck <laughs> is that even coming from like just yeah I, I guess. I guess the media picks who it likes, right? You know, um, Neil Young, by the way, I think he got away with a lot of his stuff because he's Canadian. I think same with like System of a Down. Yeah, they meant it. But also when you're coming from not the American perspective, you, you gain a little favor because people are like, oh, I'm cultured now. I listen to System of a Down. No. Well, at least in my case, not with Neil, because, I, you know, there's the famous Leonard Skinner comeback to Southern Man. Uh, you know, we don't need you around any house. And like, I, I actually hold that against Neil being a true American born in America, you know, come from a lot of Americans in my uh, family tree. And so like, I'm an American and Neil's not even from America and he's going to come and, you know, complain about it. So I actually hold him. I hold that against him. And I, I really do. Cause it's like when, when he does go too far and he does, and that's my thing. It's like, dude, go back to fucking Canada. Like Skinner. We, we, we don't need you. You know. My dad loved Neil Young. He would always play it when I was growing up. And then when I was going through my folk singer phase, I really liked Harvest. I still have a copy of Harvest and I have a copy of After the Gold Rush. But like, yeah, I've tapered so off. Somebody told me I sing like him one time and that just fucked my head up maybe not want to sing for another like year or two. I'm still recuperating from that. Um, but yeah, I've never been his biggest fan. I tried reading his autobiography. The train fetish was kind of weird. Thought it was cool. He worked with Rick James. Didn't know that, but like, I I'm not the biggest Stan. He's cool. I've always liked Bob Dylan more, but then when I found out Bob Dylan lived in Malibu, I was like, you're a fucking fake. And so I was like, ah, who who are our actual folk heroes? I I mean Neil Neil is Neil, something that I found about Neil in as of more recent years is how good he is on the electric guitar with Crazy Horse. Um, everyone kind of knows him for Harvest Years and those like you know super well known folk songs, but he's also a great rock and roll you know great rock and roll band guy. Um, so I listen to that way more of him now, um, his stuff with Crazy Horse, when he's just got this insane, huge electric guitar tone, where it's like the amp is literally about to explode at any second, and he just rides that pocket. It sounds just, you know, perfect to my ears. Um, Bob Dylan, I saw him live uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and, you know, in Bob Dylan fashion, he he's like you know playing songs no one knows and loving it and people are just sort of they don't they don't really know what to do and he, he sort of loves making everyone a little bit like uncomfortable you know that's just bob he, he will not waste his time he will not play by the rules he will not do what you want him to do and you know although i would have loved to have heard some of the songs that i know like when I see Paul McCartney and he starts playing like one after another, after another that are just golden songs. It's transcendent. I didn't get that from Bob and maybe he could have done that to me too. If he had just played a hit, you know, just one, but you got to respect him for it. Cause he's not, you know, as an artist, he's not wasting his time dragging his feet stuck in whatever he was doing that he's still doing new shit. And so, you know, I guess it's just, you know, you just have to do, you just, 
you just should do what you want to do, whether it be what Bob's doing or whether it be what Paul's doing. Um, at the end of the day, you're the one who has to make your own decisions. When you saw Bob Dylan was his band good, he usually ends up with like a killer band when he plays. They were pretty good. Um, they were pretty good. You know, it was uh, it was like seeing a new band with Bob Dylan as the front man was my experience, which was pretty, you know, unique. And it was in a pretty small theater. It's like, how the hell am I here in a small theater watching Bob Dylan play songs I've never heard in such a small venue? It was uh, kind of surreal, to be honest. There was like a couple years back where like Jim James from My Morning Jacket was in his band and like a few other like he'll get random people. I swear. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to make a bunch of false claims that I, I don't know for sure. But a lot of like big names have played with him over the last 10 years where you're like, huh, cool. So I didn't know if maybe you knew anybody or recognized him like, oh, shit, that's that's M. Ward or some fucking shit. I don't know. Well, I don't think he had any sort of like big, big other acts that were kind of just, you know, writing out a few songs kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's Bob Dylan. I mean, he's one of those guys that like, no matter who you are, you're going to drop everything and do what he wants you to do. Or, you know, it's just, it's Bob Dylan. Come on. You, uh, you hear the new Rolling Stones album since we're talking about dinosaurs here? Yeah. I, I, well, I heard, uh, I think I heard two songs. There one song, Angry, with the music video with the hot chick on the Sunset Strip. And, you know, the, what really, really turned me off and kind of pissed, just, I won't say pissed me off. Yeah, it pissed me off a little bit. It upset me. Was Mick Jagger's choice to drown his voice in autotune. Or I don't know if it was autotune or Melodyne or whatever. But he has such a bluesy delivery. And I saw the Stones live, and, and Mick Jagger can fucking sing. I wasn't a huge Mick Jagger fan. I always loved Keith Richards. But I saw the Stones live, and Mick Jagger was, I mean, what a front man. He was just so good, and you don't get it till you see him live. He's just, he's just this huge mass of energy, just putting it out, and he just gives everything. And he's like 80, and he's running around like, you know, I couldn't keep up with him. And so it's just like, you know, he's just a freak of nature. Um, and he's got this great voice. I mean, the Stones were unbelievable. They were playing the song Midnight Rambler. You probably know the song. And the dynamics go from like 11, like they go past their 10, to something that's like almost below a one. I mean, you could hear a coin drop in the stadium. And it was like, I've never seen any band come close to that in a stadium, in a huge huge stadium i mean you know to control the volume like that in like a small room but in a stadium yeah that's not they did that and Mick Jagger, he comes in with this pure robert johnson old old blues you know little like mashup like at the quietest and he just he's a pure blues guy his vocal is so it has that blues thing so good and so the thing about the blues is it's uh it's pitchy and it's like, it's, uh, you know, it's meant to be a little bit like that. So with Drowned in this, in this auto tune, it just, it was just like, I mean, it felt like a bad joke. I mean, taste wise, you would think he or Keith Richards would be like, this sounds like shit. It doesn't matter if everyone has auto tune on their voice now. We need to dial it down or we need to not use it. It's not, it just sounds terrible on his voice. I can't believe they did that. Could uh, could you imagine auto tune Howlin' Wolf? <laughs> That'd be so fucking funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh boy! So you're working on a new album. You auto tuning your voice? Um, I felt like I, ju I, I felt like I went to the dark side because I, I very recently, um realize that I have via my Pro Tools subscription, I have access to Melodyne, which is a pitch correction software. You know, everyone is very famous, very, you know, kind of like an industry standard. And so um, very recently, I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, well, maybe I'm going to cross that line. Um, and then just as of 
maybe a month ago, I I um, was mixing this live recording we did uh, with my band. And um, so I, I did a little bit of Melodyne treatment and, you know, I did it tastefully. I did it tastefully where it's just, hopefully it comes through um, where it's just at points where it's going to help and not lose, you know, never to the point where you're going to sound robotic, or at least I hope not. Um, so I'm starting to use Melodyne, but I'm using Melodyne as a tool to make my voice, you know, deliver the, deliver the vocal better and hopefully not, um, not at the extent of losing the character, losing the organic, you know, thing of the human voice. So like, good on you, recognize that it's a tool, it's okay to use it, you're not gonna, go, it's not a sin or anything. Uh, yeah. It just calls me back to like, so one of my first, when I was in high school, I was in a band, and I was such a fucking like insecure head case that like, so I wrote all the songs, but I would always hire somebody to sing it. And so I found this lady who would work for cheap to sing a song, or three songs I wrote. Uh, go to her house, record her, get back. They were the worst fucking recordings I've ever heard in my life. And so I found out Logic Pro has like pitch correction to where you can like click and drag it like the pitch itself. And so I sat there with Melodyne. There's like, I think some Celimony shit that you can use too. every bit of reverb I could find. And then like the individual audio correction. And like it took it. It took like two days to like finish all three songs, but like I felt like a fucking surgeon and like, yeah, it's a really cool use of technology, but like it takes so far away from the art, you know? And sometimes I agree that like, I mean, blues guy pitchiness is cool. Certain songs, like if you just want that raw emotion, like I would rather you be flat and like me feel what you're saying than like, on pitch and i don't feel it so that's cool but like yeah uh, you don't want to cross the dark side over to uh like you know all the fucking uh, what were those like euro disco music that was out when we were growing up like numa numa and shit like that where it's like comically used right. and applied and that's how it is in like trap music and and like <laughs> modern rap and stuff <laughs> i forgot about mumble rap sorry i could have just said mumble raps I i've been on a Early two thousands fucking Vanga Boys type shit kick the last week. It's nice. Yeah, it's um. What, what I think I found out that a bit, uh, I love the band Oasis. At least their first two albums. You kind of look like the guy from Oasis, just a little bit. And uh, I found out that on those first two records, um, the um vocals were were you know pitch corrected a little bit and i was like that shocked me and kind of broke my heart in a way kind of shattered the um naivety i guess that you know that was all real deal but i think that if you use it minimally only at key points and you use it as a tool it can be you know something that lifts the record up um and especially nowadays it, you know it's already out of the box everything now is process every record you hear now goes through that so it's not a matter of use it or don't use it it's just use it tastefully or you know ruin your song with it and so, i think you think about it as if you have a terrible voice you're going to sound like a robot but if you're pretty close you're a good singer you still sound human that was something i realized once i started using it you know um if you're if you're a good singer it's not like you sound like a robot because you're just barely you're you know you're surgically just kind of dialing it in just that little bit more gives it that little pop sheen that you need nowadays but if you're doing a blues song you know it, it would just be it would just be criminal to take a howlin wolf song and you know auto-tune those vocals it just wouldn't work i think blues just that style of singing it just doesn't work with auto-tune but if you're doing something that's more like you know pop more melodic more pop oriented um it makes sense man i could i'm just picturing how people would react if they heard me go into born under a bad sign and pitch corrected that would <laughs> dude i i no way
<laughs> It'd be funny as hell, but uh, the, the backlash from that would not be great. Yeah, there's a way to blow up the internet. Instead of AI, AI, you know, AI singers doing shit, you could do uh you could do um auto tune Jimmy Hendrix <laughs> and just get like a million views of hate. <laughs> Lord, so more of on your album that you finally used Melodyne for. How many tracks? How long did it take? What's it so, called? So for my album, um, I've got one that has been finished for a while. My first album has been out since 2022. And um, I had been recording, you know, probably even this the album that's going to come out. I've been recording that album, like, probably as the, the other one was coming out kind of thing. I'm always, like, ahead of it. Um, because the logistics of not just finishing one album, but then getting it out. It's like, there are a lot of things that have to go. So normally the album is finished for a while before it finally gets released. So this album that is going to come out for me soon, um, two singles are out of, um, and it's quite a journey with this album. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Um, it, um, was initially supposed to be my first album and uh i was going to this studio that was like a almost an hour i mean in traffic it would have been a nightmare drive but without traffic it was probably like 30 45 maybe an hour drive and i would go there i knew a kid um, who was a really solid engineer and they had a really nice studio built in their garage fantastic setup and i had a deal good good deal to record with them and um but it's just the setup of only having a pretty limited amount of time to work per week just wasn't working and i really was grinding to make it work i was really committed to making it work so i spent months and months and months doing this thing where i would you know work for four hours two nights four hours a week kind of a thing just have all this middle time where i'm like coming up with more ideas that i want to try but the thing is like you have to be in the studio to try out ideas as they come. Because if you're just sitting around that all that time in between just wasn't working. Um, so I got to the end of a lot of time and a lot of commitment and got to the end and even had the album mastered and uh, decided to hold it back. Um, so re-recorded it. And the, the first album, the second, the first album that I released was the second album I recorded, held the first one back, and then re-recorded that first one um, that was an, originally supposed to be my first one. I didn't, because I knew, I love the songs. They're great songs. I played them with, um, you know, different bands and, you know, just a lot of guys like have played these songs and, you know, they've been around for a long time and they're just great songs. And um, so I, I, I was... I finished them and uh, I produced it myself. Um, and uh, there's another record label that uh, might release it. If it's a good deal, I'll do it so that they can hopefully do some marketing. Um, and I'm waiting to see what that deal looks like uh, any day now. Maybe later today, I'll get that contract. Um, in which case, if I do go with them, it will probably take more time for that album to come out because I'll have to do some prep work. If I decide not to go with them because the offer sucks, which it you know very well could, knowing the music industry and knowing what businesses do to you know guys like me, guys like you, got anybody who's actually making music, real music, just you know let's fuck them over so that music is terrible all around the board. Yeah. Um, so I'm well prepared for that. And so it's just a matter of whether this album is going to go out with them. It might take a couple more months. And if not, I'm going to put it out maybe in December, maybe in January. And I'm really. Uh, I just, well, I love that attitude because it's so problematic for record labels. They're not going to like that. Like all your guys are out here to do is fuck me over. <laughs> <laughs> They give you a good deal and you're still coming in with that. They're like, yeah, this guy, a little bit of a problem over here. 
No, I that's fucking great because it's super important for songwriting to it doesn't matter what fucking stage you're in, always be ready and happy to re-record it. Because just let alone tastes change, mind changes, and things can change. Shit can happen. Shit could like you could have your masters just get completely fucked up right on the day that it's supposed to be released and like oh fuck yes we're redoing it but like and what are you gonna do get mad about it Bruh, i've spent i probably wasted 10 years of my life not consecutively but like in a very short period of time like within six months stressed for 10 years over shit like that i'm having to re-record losing deleting whatever and Same. like there's no point like after the hundredth time i'm like i really have to redo it i'm like love it just, just, I don't have a choice. Fucking love it. I, 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 I know that feeling so well. I've experienced that feeling. You know how you, you have, you have an intuition that knows what's right and what's wrong. And it's very, you know, that is the artist that that's the journey. That's the process of how do you make your idea that turned you on that made you actually want to spend your time doing this? How do you honor that idea? And really just translate it to the, whatever medium, whether it be a film, whether it be a book, whether it be anything, a song. How do you get that idea and, you know, honor that idea and translate it to a song? And um, it's not a waste if you learn craft along the way and, and you get it right in the end. And that's how it was for me. And um, there's always a little voice in the back of your head, or at least me, that's like, it's a little bit wrong. Or it's a, this is a little bit off, but if, but if you, if you, you know, really stay true to that idea and you, and in the process of translating it to the final product and you honor that every step of the way, um, then you can get it to a point where it's right in your heart. You know, it's right. Yeah. Maybe there's something that could be a little different and stuff, but that's surface level on a real level in your heart, you know, you 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 honored that idea and that's where i'm at and that's the way i do it now and um that was a great piece of knowledge for someone to really articulate you know once once i heard that articulated the right way you know it, it helped me in my process big time oh right on yeah no those were some seriously wise words there i really thank you for the insight well, Owen Hamlin, where can they find your stuff? We've done, we I know this is going to be on your channel, but where can you be found with these wise words and inspirational music? Um so uh I actually have a website now. Woo! Uh yeah, owenhamlin.com. <laughs> I'm not sure why I need it. But I was told I need a website, and I finally, I finally sold out and got a website. So you can find me there, OwenHamlin.com. I'll say nothing else. 